Welcome back to News On. So much for Biden's bold new agenda. Democrats now opt for the president's plan B as they enter their second year in control of both the White House and Congress. Meanwhile, Democrat Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema heading back to work today with a political scarlet letter, if you will, from the Arizona Democratic Party. Cinema was censured Saturday because she voted against changing the Senate's filibuster rules and against forcing voting rights legislation through. Cinema and West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin were the only two Democrats, in fact, to join Republicans in opposing that move. Now, while the censure is largely symbolic, it does highlight the backlash that Cinema is getting for voting the way she did. And now a new generation of liberal Democrats are entering the political arena with just a rush of candidates looking to basically oust the party's old guard this year. Will they be successful? Well, to find out, we want to welcome in our panel. Joining us live now, we have attorney and Democratic strategist Ken Altshuler and CEO and founder of Stock Swoosh, Melissa Armo. Ken, I am so interested to hear your feedback on this one. So you said, if memory serves me correctly, you said on this very show that you believed America was shifting to be more moderate, if not conservative. And there have been some polls out there suggesting that you're right, that a number of independents now, since Biden even took office, are now joining the Republican Party. So what does that mean for this new squad coming in, looking to get rid of the old guard, if you will? Well, and you're right. I did say that, and I still believe that. I do think there's been a shift to the right. Uh, I think it's been coming for a while, and I think it's going to continue for a while, and may, may be permanent. Um, it reminds me of the Tea Party. It reminds me of the fringe of the parties where the Republicans were splintered in the early years of Obama's administration by Tea Parties wanting a radical agenda from a moderate perspective, and they're no different now. Now, the progressives have been somewhat held at bay by Nancy Pelosi, of all people, and Joe Biden, who actually is more popular with the progressives than the mainstream Democratic Party. So go figure that out. But I still think it's a minority view. I think that the pragmatic view is that moderation is what wins the day. But are you asking me, do I think the Democrats will splinter much like the Republicans did and learn to overcome it? I think they will. And I don't think the Democrats are going to be that quick to overcome it. I think that if they do do that, it's going to be a disaster. You've got to stay in the middle because who makes the election results? It's the what the independents, the 10 percent in the middle, not affiliated with either party that says who's going to get elected. So if you lose them, you lose the election. Melissa, what do you think about this idea that it's the 10 percent? Some may even argue the 20 percent, right? There's that 80, 20 percent rule that typically applies to just about anything uh, that if you go more left, it's actually going to backfire when it comes to independence and you will lose in the long run. Do you agree with that assessment? I think overall, it's a problem no matter what the percentage is, whether it's the independents or otherwise regular voters. If the election was held tomorrow, I think because of the state of the economy, I think the Democrats would lose. They would lose the House. And I think we're a long way from the election. But the problem is right now, things seem to be getting worse every day instead of better. And I'm talking about economically. When you have a period of inflation and people are paying and living paycheck to paycheck and things keep going up like gas and food, it's a problem when people go to the polls. Even right now, I have friends in New York, which is very, very democratic, very far to the left, that regret voting for Biden, given all the decisions that he's made in the last few months. And I think it has not been a good start to 2022 for the Democrats. But have they moved to Florida? Because we've noticed a huge influx. Just curious. Uh, but moving on, though, in all seriousness, <laughs> I want to bring up this pro-life march uh, for life that happened over the weekend in D.C. that sounded basically very different from some of the past marches that we've had, more of a victory celebration, if you will. Protesters say there's just this growing sense of optimism that they haven't felt in a long time as we're seeing uh, some wins for pro-lifes in light of several Supreme Court rulings, and there are still more to come on the docket. And now you have South Dakota GOP Governor Christine Ohm. This is something that Dr. Wendy Patrick, who we have on Fridays, predicted would happen. Uh, she's now proposing uh, anti-abortion legislation that is based around the time of the fetal heartbeat. And in a Fox interview, 
uh, the governor claimed that 71 percent of Americans believe there should be reasonable restrictions on abortion, meeting somewhere in the middle, kind of going back to your point, Ken. Uh, but we've talked about Texas. We've talked a little bit about the Supreme Court taking up Mississippi. And now you've got uh, Governor Christine Ohm in South Dakota wanting to introduce her own legislation, creating this basically um, blueprint for red states to introduce new legislation law. How successful do you think she'll be in other states? Well, I think she. I think the more extreme views will not be necessarily successful, but I think you're going to see a, a two-part country. I mean, the Supreme Court, what they're doing is not so much striking down abortion, but enforcing states' rights. What What's going to happen with Roe v. Wade, in my opinion, is that at best, they're going to leave it up to the states to do what restrictions they want. And as I've said before, the Republicans have been very good in the last 10 years focusing on state houses instead of federal elections. So you have, a, you have the the majority of state houses controlled by Republicans, you're going to see restrictions in those states. Abortion will not end, but it'll be restricted to the more liberal states. So New York City is going to have a boon of abortions, and you're going to have none in Alabama and Missouri and Mississippi and South Dakota, North Dakota, Missouri, those states, Texas, obviously. So what's going to happen is you're going to have poor people, poor women that are not going to be able to get abortions because they're not going to be able to afford to go to states to get them. And so there's going to be a backlash on that front, too. But, yes, it's going to be restrictive. I think most of these restrictions will uphold. I don't think the real restrictive laws will, but I certainly think the 23-week viability line will be easily enforceable. The heartbeat law will be more difficult, but I think there will be some states who will pass it, and I think the Supreme Court will uphold them. What do you think about Ken's predictions, Melissa? Do you agree? I think he's right that there's going to be different states that have very different laws, just like he mentioned about New York. But the problem is that people that want to get an abortion that can't in that state, instead of going to a different state, may end up having illegal abortions. And that ends up being very dangerous then for the mother. So I know the, con the court is conservative, but the court has not been as conservative as people thought. So while pro-lifers are very optimistic, like Ken says, I don't think it's necessarily going to turn over Roe versus Wade. It's just going to go back to the states and then it's going to depend on where you go and where you live. But that could be problematic for some women. Love to know our viewers' thoughts. Again, to any of these topics, you can always weigh in by finding me at Real Miranda Con, hashtag share your voice. Real quickly, though, uh, as I mentioned, the Pro for Life rally, that was just one rally that happened over the weekend. Here's another. Vaccine passports. You have, you have a series of rights as flawed as our government has, is you can still go out and go to a bar, you can go to a sporting event, you can get on a bus or an airplane and you can travel, you have certain freedom, you can get educated, etc. The minute they hand you that vaccine passport, every right that you have is transformed into a privilege contingent upon your obedience to arbitrary government dictates. It will make you a slave. That was just one of many speeches that people heard that gathered in D.C. yesterday. There are about 30,000 protesters who came to the city calling for a nationwide COVID-19 vaccine mandates to come to an end, saying basically they're Ovid over COVID. So I want to get your predictions on that and where you see the country headed when we return. So panel, please stick around. Also, we talked a lot about Democrats there and this supposed shift to be more progressive, more left-leaning, if you will. But what does the future hold for Republicans? Uh, some are saying it comes down to McConnell versus former President Donald Trump. Do you agree? Do you disagree? And we're going to explain that assessment coming up a little bit later. Also, we talked about Kristen Cinema being censured. Well, somebody else who was also stripped of her committee roles, uh, you may remember Representative Liz Cheney. Some uh, Republicans referring to her as a rhino. How much longer she may stay in office when News On returns. We'll be right back.